Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana White. Welcome to the Myth Salon. Well, in wake of the Sandy Hook decision today, uh, or yesterday, it really is appropriate that I think we're having a discussion about violence in, in the culture. Um, I've been reading Hillman's book, A Terrible Love of War. We have several of us who spent time in the military and we're really pleased and fortunate and honored to have Dr. Michael Conforti, who is the founder and director of the Assisi Institute. So, what I'd like to do is start off with a moment of silence. The people who have been victimized by violence in our culture, many of them don't come back. There are friends, family, their relatives, people down the street, people we don't know. But it's life transforming when something like this happens, when somebody just goes berserk and starts shooting up, shooting up a school. So let's have a little moment of silence, please. One of my real influences was a poet, early 20th century poet named Robinson Jeffers. This weekend, there's a, a poetry special in Carmel about Robinson Jeffers, who, like Jung, built a home made out of stone. It's called the Tor House. And in 1944, he wrote a poem, a very short little poem, as the war was coming to an end. We have now won two world wars, neither of which concerned us. We were slipped in. We have leveled the powers of Europe that were the powers of the world into rubble and dependence. We have won two wars and a third is coming this one, it will not be so easy. We were at ease while the powers of the world were split into factions. We changed that. We have enjoyed fine dreams. We have dreamed of unifying the world and we are unifying it against us. 1944, he wrote that. So I'd like now to turn the myth salon over to my good friend and partner, Will Lynn, and who just had his school shut down because of a sh possible shooting. Maybe he'll say something about that. It seems appropriate to open the myth salon today with something that draws us closer to the actual perspective of what we're talking about. Makes me sad. Will? Thanks, Dana. Uh, and it is, it is an amazing, these things get closer and closer. These things that seemed like uh, distant on the periphery of our cultural mythology have inched towards our own private experience to the point of uh, collective, collective participation in what were once these outlier experiences. Uh, the funny thing for me is that while I want to say that, uh, acknowledge the fact that these myth salons really started in the context of COVID and a collective, the original myth salons uh, around a certain election, but these online myth salons really getting launched around the, the context of COVID. Um, and I now realize that the theme has shifted, starting really with the invasion of Ukraine and our conversations with Kira uh, towards something else that we're trying to make sense of, towards trying to make sense of the violence and the tectonic shifts 
and um, global structures from economic to uh, military alliances. So for me, while I wanna say here we are shifting from out of COVID and into this other thing, Biden did say it's all over. Uh, here I am saying it as someone with COVID right now. <laughs> so um, it's a little odd, it's a little odd. So we had previous conversations and, and a recurring theme for us is constantly an effort to make sense of our world and what's going on. I remember the first time I read Michael Conforti's book, A Field, Form and Fate, and really resonated with its focus on the archetypal. It's focused on making sense of reality through an archetypal lens, through an understanding of the way that our archetypal reality actually actually manifests and participates in our reality. Not only is this abstract idea. So it's really a privilege and really a wonderful opportunity for all of us to welcome uh, Dr. Conforti tonight to talk with us about what's going on uh, in our world, especially in the context of violence and war. It's my privilege to introduce our panel. Dr. Dana White, host of this Myth Salon, producer, publisher, contributing member of Pacifica's Myth Faculty, and dare I say, good guy. It was good to see you when you were in town last week. My name is Will Lynn, moderator of these Myth Salons, founding chair of the General Education Department at Hushman College, where I teach myth to storytellers and host the Sky and CDF television series, uh, The Greatest Mysteries in Humanity. Clay Boykin is a former United States Marine Corps artillery officer and served as a unit level executive officer and nuclear safety officer. Today, Clay is a business development, leadership, and organizational change management consultant, where he develops and enhances creative and counterintuitive thinking in individuals, teams, and in the corporate C-suite. Clay is the author of the book, Circles of Men, a counterintuitive approach to creating men's groups, and he's the creator and host of the podcast, In Search of the New Compassionate Male. Clay's next book, Unstuck, The Art of Creating a New Lens Through Which We See Our World, is due out mid next year. Dr. Nathan Hogan joining us for the first time tonight is a retired veteran having served nearly 22 years in both the US Air Force and Army. His military experience included multiple combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as numerous operational deployments around the world. Nathan earned his master's in history with a concentration in global history from American Military University and his PhD in mythological studies with an emphasis in depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. He served on the senior committee for the University of Arizona's College of Humanities, Thunder of War, Winds of Return project, focused on using important humanity sources to create dialogue about the experience of war. And he's also a leader of the Joseph Campbell Foundation Mythological Roundtable chapter in Tucson, Arizona. He currently works as a senior analyst and developer for Titania Solutions Group. Robert A. Jonas was trained in object relations psychology at Harvard and used his postdoc masters in spirituality from Weston Jesuit School of Theology to explore the healing resonances between Christian contemplative prayer, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and Buddhist uh, Vipassana Zen and Tibetan meditation. Jonas founded the Empty Bell Sanctuary in Western Massachusetts in 1994 and now leads interfaith contemplative groups. He's a biographer of Henry Nguyen and a student of Sui Zen, the Japanese bamboo flute. And I had to, you know, I just remind, reread this like five times to really catch, really believe this is real. But he has performed in many secular and spiritual contexts and has played at three Buddhist Christian retreats with the Dalai Lama, including under the Bodhi tree, Bodhi tree in India, to play the flute with the Dalai Lama, Lama under the Bodhi tree in India. Jonas has recorded three CDs. His Suizen album, Blowing Bamboo, is available on iTunes and one example of his many integrations of uh, Shaka Huachi and nature. Christoph, is great to have you with us. Christoph uh, has presented with us back in Dana's living room, a long lost living room at this point. Christoph Lemuel, PhD, is a quantum physicist trained in France. And something I wanted to point out is I enjoyed the idea of pulling this bio specifically from the Assisi Institute's webpage, uh, as uh, Christoph has presented there many times. So Christoph is a quantum physicist trained in France. He's currently the executive director of the C.G. Young Institute of Los Angeles and co-chief editor of the Journal of Psychological Perspectives, a quarterly journal of Jungian thought. He's in analytical training in Zurich at the Research and Training Center for Depth Psychology, according to the C.G. Young and Mary Louise von Franz. His passion is the connection of matter and psyche. He's written several articles on this subject, and Dr. Lemuel is a frequent presenter at the Assisi Institute his work continues to make vital contributions to their ongoing investigations into the confluence of matter and spirit. And finally, Dr. Mike, uh, Michael Conforti is a Jungian analyst and the founder and director of the CC Institute. He's a faculty member at the C.G. Jung Institute of Boston and C.G. Jung Foundation of New York, and for many years served as a senior associate faculty member in the doctoral and master programs in clinical psychology at Antioch, New England. 
A pioneer in the field of matter psyche studies, Dr. Conforti is actively investigating the workings of archetypal fields and the relationship between Jungian psychology and the new sciences. Michael Conforti offers insight into the workings of psyche and archetypal dynamics and patterns so as to provide a modicum of hope and a framework from which, with which to understand and navigate current world events. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. I mean, it's a wonderful group you put together here with military, with psychologists, with musicians. So thank you. <clears throat> it's a bit of an introduction. I've been an analyst for about 40 years now. I trained in New York. I began this really young. And I was at a program recently that kind of sets the tone for what I want to say, where people were talking about all the wonderful things about life, you know, the, the beauty of psyche, the beauty of the unconscious. Um, we find our way to grace. And it was my turn to speak. I said, you know, I would love to begin this way. I can't. I've been dealing with people that have suffered severe traumas for many, many years. I began that way. Also, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, Italian Sicilian neighborhoods. And you see a lot of violence. I work with a number of mafia people. And you, you're brought into this other world, and you realize the underbelly of humanity is as alive as the, as the heavens. And... I've realized that in order, in order to get to the, the transcendent and the numinous, which is there for all of us, it seems to be sort of a stadial developmental issue where you need to go first to shadow. And where Jung was brilliant with shadow, and you, you mentioned 1940, some uh, that work you talked about, um, Jung's work. When he talked about the, the Nazi, the Nazi invasion, the uprising. He said there was something, something active in the psyche of humanity at that point. Remember he said that the world will pay forever more for what is consolidated right now in the unconscious? He did mince words and he wasn't the least bit uh, careful about talking about the utter violence that's coming out of the unconscious. In many ways, that I, I think the concept of shadow, where it started off as talking about this underbelly, has been sanitized to the extent that we talk about, well, you're not as so polite, you're not as nice as you should be, you're a little bit rough the other day to somebody, a little, you know, a little arrogant with your kids. And we forget, we forget what really drives us. And we forget that many people are embedded in this field of, let's call it evil. This presentation is probably the most difficult one I ever put together. I, I wrote this paper about three months ago. It's in response to an initiative we're doing with the CC Foundation, the nonprofit arm of the Institute. And we're doing a whole piece on crimes against humanity. And this was the opening piece. And you know, I'm happy to say we had 2,000 people, 2,000 participants from 30, 35, 38 different countries listening. And we did it in four languages, Italian, uh, Spanish, Russian, and English. And it seemed to hit, it seemed to resonate with a lot of people. And I think what resonated is the attempt to understand what, what drives people to do what we do. And I, I think there's a new challenge. I say a little bit to a lot of part of the paper, but just as a sort of a preamble. We, we've studied archetypes for a long time, all of us. You know, we don't know, we, we know a little bit about it. You know, we've touched a little bit, right? I think the next level of investigation for us, and partly Christoph, your work, I think touches this is to see, is there any way to interact with the archetype itself? And just a, a brief story. Many years ago, I was lecturing in Montreal. And this man, he was a psychiatrist from Argentina. And he said, can I ask you a question? He said, I really, I've been following your work. I respect what you've been doing for many years. And you seem to address how the archetype affects the individual. I said, yeah, that's what I, I, try, to, I try to look at, understand it. And he said, have you ever tried to address the actual workings of an archetype itself? I said, I don't really understand what you mean. He said, say the archetype of the devouring mother, the devouring father, the archetype of benevolence, the archetype of, of, of grace. And is there a way you can actually go in and touch it and, and maybe make a difference somewhere? I said, you know, I'm ashamed to say I never thought about it. I don't know if it's possible. I don't know if it's inflated thinking, but I said it never even dawned on me to ask that question. So in many ways, this paper is an attempt to understand something about what drives us and the consequences. And I don't think that as a collective, 
not just America. I mean, the, the, all the people involved in war and you soldiers, you veterans, thank you for everything you've done to risk your life for all of us. Thank you. And I mean that. I was just involved with a group of people at the Naval War College in, over here in Rhode Island for a, a commencement for one of the guys who just became a captain. And, and I felt, you know, I was never around military before. And I felt such a, a, a sense of appreciation for what they do. They all risked their lives for us like you guys did. Why do we put people in this position? And, and I want to say also from the start that this is not a paper against war. That's not the point. And when you hear some of the references I make in this paper, and a lot, some of these are from a little known book written by Freud and Einstein, which I found in my research. I, maybe some of you know it. It's called Why War? It's a correspondence. And I think that I found, I think two of them you can find on the internet, two books like $200 or $2,000 or whatever. But you can, you can download some of the papers. And Einstein approached Freud saying, you know, you've been you've been dealing with humanity for how many years? Can you've been looking at a lot of dark issues? You've been looking at things that make people crazy. You're looking at how people recover. Can can you apply this lens to culture to see what we could do to maybe stem the the tide of war? You know, whatever this aggressive, hadiotic instinct is in people, can we do something about it? That's what this paper is about. And the people I draw from really heavily, which is, is the work of Elie Wiesel. And some people have said that if there was a modern day sage, it was Elie Wiesel. And I had the good fortune to meet him about 10, 15 years ago. I had a private interview with him, a private meeting. And aside from the birth of my son, probably the most important event that ever happened, to, to be with a man that's been through what he was through and come out of it to be able to help so many people. Also, I mean, obviously Jung is a big part of this work, Freud's work, and Hillman, and I don't mention him directly, but you know, his work on why war, the passion for war, it's all part of this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read and talk, okay? And if you know anybody from Brooklyn, you just can't sit still, you know? And, and it's not gonna be a dry reading of a paper. So let me begin. And, and I hope that in some ways, that this paper offers some meaningful way to understand what, what is driving war and maybe something we could do about it. And the other piece is the consequences. And one other note I'll make right now. <clears throat> one of the things that seems to take people down faster than anything, that, that can easily ruin a life, compromise a life. I mean, good people, people with resources, intelligent, artistic. It's unconscious guilt. We all, we all know what we've done. I mean, we all have something that we, we say, oh my God, I wish I could pull that one back. You know, do a read like in the movies, right? We all have something. There are some major things we've done in our life that you know we understand, we, we know what we did, but we often don't know the unconscious implication of the actions. What we've done with our children, what we've done with spouse, what we've done with students. And now take it on a global level, what we've done with our people the population, the, the citizens of our country. How do you put somebody in a body bag and, and, and without having a say, look, we have to protect our own shores. I don't know how we do it. And again, you soldiers, you, you I'm sure can contribute a lot to this presentation tonight, to this whole investigation. And as you're going to hear in Freud's piece, Freud said, you know, Freud, Freud echoed what I should say, Elie Wiesel echoed what Freud said when they were both asked, are you optimistic about being able to find a way to address what's in humanity that, that drives us to these kind of actions? Freud said, I'm not the least bit optimistic. At the end of his life, Elie Wiesel said, well, are you optimistic? And he said, about what? We still have genocide. In America alone, as I mentioned in another paper I've just done, we've had over two genocides in America. Where's the unconscious guilt? How much of that is still driving what we do in this country? So with that as a backdrop, I want to go in and like I'm going to read it. I'm going to come in and out of it, okay? And, and then in a little bit, I'll mention uh, when we get to the Elie Wiesel piece, can you put it on the screen, okay? The Nobel Prize uh, speech. <clears throat> to provide an orientation into the nature of this talk, it's important from the outset to say that at this point in human evolution, psychological development, 
and our collective in very limited ways of understanding and grappling with the dark content of the unconscious, that war may still be an unfortunate necessity. This, re this may remain the case until there is a profound shift in our relationship to unconscious contents and motivations and our capacity to live with and deal with unconscious guilt and more. So too, we need to thank our soldiers who have risked their lives and given their lives in the hopes of freedom. And they believe in the cause. Everyone loses when we respond to conflict by engaging the archetype of war. Untold victims, displaced citizens, and soldiers on both sides never knowing if they will ever return home. The intoxication of war breeds its own monsters. The moment we engage in battle, we enter a prefigured archetypal field. Here, terror for one's own life, hatred of the other who could take our life in a moment, and the collectively inherited rage accumulated since the beginning of time we had to fight for our survival becomes activated. We fight and defend. Fight or be killed. While to lay down your arms may be the prelude to laying down your life. The reptilian brain has taught us well to respond with a surge of adrenaline opiates released into the bloodstream that turns that precious little schoolboy and girl into a warrior, lusting for blood, for revenge, and praying for the death of an enemy they will never even know. The impersonal nature of war allows a soldier to fight with the vigor and hate of an engaged warrior by necessity. A number of years ago, a solution was suggested and I'd like to hear what, what our veterans say about this. A solution was suggested for the ongoing killings at a border guard in a certain country, right at the border, okay? Soldiers on both sides. And day after day, they would kill each other. There's an 80% fatality at this border crossing, the two countries. And actually, it was the ambassador from Venezuela, the former ambassador from Venezuela, Roberto Palacio, a great, great man, who told me this story. And actually, he got me involved with the, uh, the Peace Institute, trying to get a grant to study some of this. He said, what they did was they said, Let's, we're going to try something. Let's get name tags on the soldiers, say from this country and then this country. Hi, my name is Will, and, and, and I live in this place. I have a TV show. I work with kids. Nathan, I, I, I'm a father and I'm a husband. And Christoph, I have twins and I have these lovely kids I'm raising. I go to Zurich to train. And they said, you know what happened? The fatalities went from 80% down to like 5%. And the, the reasoning is that they made something that was archetypal, they made it personal. Archetypal is transpersonal. And as Jung said, throughout his career, it creates a contagious effect on people. It's, con it's contagion, archetypal contagion. And to use a word you may be familiar with, when an archetype is activated, there's an entrainment that occurs. Okay, you know from physics, first off, entrainment, right? Those who speak Italian, trascinare is the same thing, where you're caught like in a wave, right? The wave comes, you know the feeling as a kid, you ride the wave and you get inside and it pulls you to shore. It's, a, it's intoxicating. Archetypes take us into this swell and into the vortex. And we begin to respond to the properties and mandates and dominance of that archetype. If you're a soldier, if you're a victim, prisoner, a father and a mother. So what happened here was they, they broke the spell of that transpersonal pull of the archetype, of the, of the entrainment. They made it personal. And entrainment is so powerful. Some of you, again, Nathan, some of the, the veterans may know this, that when soldiers are being asked to cross say, a wooden bridge and they're in, they're in sync, perfect cadence, they're asked, please break rank, whatever the language is. Don't, don't have perfect cadence. Don't. Because that perfect cadence would resonate with the properties of the bridge and it could actually collapse the bridge. That's the power of entrainment in the natural world. My work has been a lot about with the help of some great physicists. And yes, Christoph has presented many times for us as, as a gifted faculty member to learn how properties in the outer world mirror properties in the inner world and vice versa. So when you see entrainment in the outer world and these powerful resonant patterns, you realize, my God, this is what Jung was talking about when he talked about uh, contagion. And he always said, be careful, be careful, be careful. Don't get caught in a swell. And we have many practices that we'd never even think about that are really attempts to break the entrainment. You go to a theater, a wonderful show, right? 
whether it's a you know a, a tr Greek tragedy, whether it's a joyful story, whatever. I was watching La Boheme, you know, and the whole aria, Mimi's aria. And what happens after the after they they do a pause, right? What do you call it? a little a break during the thing, the action, or at the end they clap. The clapping is an attempt to break the resonant pattern of the story, to bring you back to the outer world, because a good theater, good music, good loving, whatever it is, it brings you into the swell, into the vortex of that archetypal field. And and I'm sure we know all the generative aspects of that when we're writing, when when you are so in love with somebody, either with your child, with a mate, whatever it might be, you're loving the, the, the writing you're doing, I'm sure will, what you do for your TV show and all, it, it's, it's a wonderful intoxication and we need to go with it. And at some point, you, you, you have to break that entrainment. Like I was just at the gym the other day and I was just so into what I did. And my friend, he taps me on my shoulder and I jump, I almost jumped out of my skin. And he said, what the hell's going on with you, Mike? I said, no, I just was so involved in what I was doing. When you're reading, you, you get brought in. You know, when you go to a movie and it's not that good, you say, oh, you know, you want to get popcorn, you want a hot dog, you want soda, because it, it, it's, not, it's not powerful enough that the archetypal story is not being presented accurately. Romeo and Juliet, you brought in West Side Story, Fiddler on the Roof. You're brought into the angst of the story and the beauty of it. OK, that's what I'm talking about with, with this issue here. So what happened at the border for these people, the soldiers that were, you're my enemy. If I don't kill you, you're going to kill me. And if you kill me, my family suffers. You get the picture, right? Suddenly, it's not as easy to kill what is familiar. That's the point they discovered here. It's much easier to kill the anonymous one. The, the German, the Russian, the American, the Italian, the Jew. They just become the Jew, the Italian, the Russian, the German, and you kill them. It was a brilliant thing, a brilliant observation that they had. And it worked. It worked. Everyone loses in war. The enemy and even the victors who, upon returning home, cut up forever scarred, knowing in their hearts that they can never really return home. No comfort food, no warm embrace will ever soothe the wounds of one who has seen such killings and known such fear. And I'm sorry, those of you that are veterans, this is a little difficult to, to hear, okay? I apologize in advance. As Jung and the early Jungians made public their understanding of the world war and the nature of the contents emerged from the dark, un dark unconscious, we, as more modern day Jungians, can now take up the torch and hopefully add something to our collective understanding that crimes against humanity are the face of these contents from the dark unconscious. They result from a massive individual and collective possession by these unconscious contents. That's what Jung understood. When he said many of his patients were having dreams of blood and violence, and he said, what the heck is going on here? And he realized it was the, arch it was the archetype, the archetype of Wotan that was activated. And he said, it, it's, it's creating this swell, it's creating this entrainment. And again, when he said the world will pay forevermore, I mean, it's going to be a tragedy like we've never seen before. Where are we now? How many years later we're still affected by it? And they say the second generation of survivors are affected even more than the first generation. And some studies are even saying it's actually part of the DNA of the, of the children, of the grandchildren. Okay. You, you, and this has been my work. You, you don't escape trauma. You, you find a way to live with it, you know, and, and it, hopefully you're not possessed by it. Okay. So too did Jung and his early Jungians look into the nature of war and its aftermath, and they understood something of the perpetual hauntings these experiences leave in their wake, a scorched earth, a haunted soul searching for yet often never finding home or peace. Our hope is that we have learned something of the contents of this unconscious, the effects of it being unleashed within the collective, and we pray of finding some way to halt the ongoing escalation of such madness and abuses against humanity. And, you know, it's, it's a bit of a synchronicity. We're doing this piece right now. The United Nations just passed a major sanction today. We're not a sanction. They said, look, you know, we're, we're officially saying we're totally against what Russia is doing and the attempt to uh, annex parts of uh, the Ukraine. We're against it. And I heard a wonderful interview today. But you know what the interviewer said? 
They said, uh, it's wonderful. You, you have this thing and you, you're saying that you get this principle and you, you've made these statements to Russia. Is it doing anything? One of the things that haunted Elie Wiesel throughout, and those that don't know Elie Wiesel, you know, one of the, uh, he was one of the last survivors from Auschwitz. He was in the camp as a, a nine and 10 year old little boy. And he said, I will never stop being haunted by the fact that the world knew what was going on. Roosevelt, Churchill, and all the world leaders, they, we, we had uh, surveillance photos. We knew, they, the world knew what was going on. And he said, every day we hesitated to go in, another 100,000 people were killed and slaughtered. And I'm sure there were, there were military strategies. I, I can imagine that. But in, in some ways it's, you know, we, we try to develop all these strategies, but while people are, are dying, how many die, people are dying right now? People are dying. I have a lot of Ukrainian and Russian students. And you know what the Russian students told me? They said, we were afraid to have more of these conferences with you. I meet with them every week, you know, for the past four years. I've been to Russia a few times. They said, we were afraid America would hate all of us because we're Russian. And I said, no. And then they all said, you know, we don't, this is not our war. And I'll tell you one other story, the closest I ever came to war, and again, it's nothing what Nathan, you, and... And, and Clay had been through. I can't imagine what you've been through. One of the days I had the seminar with our Russian Ukrainian students and the Russians were all on, you know, we had it's an hour seminar and about 10 minutes before the ending, our Ukrainian student got on and, you know, she's smiling, whatever. And then all of a sudden to me, they asked her, how are you? And she broke down. She was in a bunker and she said, we're fighting for our life. And, and the, the, the Russian student they, and the Ukrainian, they, they, they're together, families, cousins, marriage by marriage. And they say, this, we don't want this. And, you know, one of the things that gets me with this, and then the next big lecture I'm working on is domestic, the archetype of domestic violence. How do we allow this stuff to happen? We, we know it happens. And as you're going to hear in this talk, Freud was asked, you know, and I'll say to the group, I don't think I said it earlier, Freud and, and Einstein wrote a book together back in 1931-32, and it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a correspondence. It's a collection of the correspondence they did. It's a fantastic piece of work. And those of you that are interested, you can download the letters. It's, the book is called Why War? And Einstein, it was, uh, I believe it was funded by UNESCO, UNESCO. And Einstein invited Freud to be part of it because of his work. And towards the end of it, and they, a lot of dialogue, and I'll speak about some of it. But Freud said, unfortunately, we may continue to need externally driven stops, uh, agencies to handle this because the human condition doesn't seem able to handle whatever is in us that drives us into these acts of brutality, these crimes against humanity. We don't seem to have the capacity to stop it right now. I'd love to hear what the Dalai Lama says, Jonas, about this. I would love to hear that, you know, what some of the greats say. We're not, he, the, the, too many voices are silenced right now. But he said, it's unfortunate that we will need a, a collectively governing body to make decisions because we can't, we can't do it right now, unfortunately. And that was what, 1931, 32. And they wrote that book, believe it or not, they had the correspondence before the war. Pretty, you talk about it as, field and form. Something was brewing and they pick up the zeitgeist of what was consolidated. As we, cross, as we cross the threshold into the domain of war and crimes against humanity, we do well to remember the sadness and hopes for a future stolen from all those who have already perished and for those whose tomorrows hold but a flicker of hope. I want to now read one of the most powerful pieces of writing I've ever heard. It's Elie Wiesel's acceptance speech when he got the Nobel Prize. It is with a profound sense of humility that I accept the honor you have chosen to bestow upon me. I know your choice transcends me. This both frightens and pleases me. Yeah, I can see that all in the copy. Hold on. It frightens me because I wonder, do I have the right to represent the multitudes who have perished? 
Do I have the right to accept this great honor on their behalf? I do not. That would be presumptuous. No one may speak for the dead. No one may interpret their mutilated dreams and visions. It pleases me because they may say that this honor belongs to all the survivors and their children and through us to the Jewish people whose destinies I've always identified with. I remember, he's such a fantastic writer. I remember it happened yesterday or eternities ago. A young Jewish boy discovered the kingdom of night. I remember his bewilderment. I remember his anguish. It all happened so fast, the ghetto, the deportation, the sealed cattle cars, the fiery altar upon which the history of our people and the future of mankind were meant to be sacrificed. I remember he asked his father, can this be true? This is the 20th century, not the Middle Ages. Who would allow such crimes to be committed? How could the world remain silent? This could be written for what we're going through right now. I, I, I thought as I was going over my notes, I thought, my God, we're back in the same situation today. Anything that repeats itself is archetypal. And remember one of Freud's greatest lines, we repeat what we don't want to remember. Jung said it, but much more lyrically and poetically, he said, what we don't face consciously come back to us as fate. Let me just read this one little piece again. Do you realize what he's saying here? I remember he asked his father, can this be true? This is the 20th century, not the Middle Ages. Who would allow such crimes to be committed? How could the world remain silent? Guess what? He was still pretty silent. And now the boy is turning to me. Tell me, he asked, what have you done with my future? What have you done with your life? And I tell him that I've tried, that I've tried to keep memory alive, that I have tried to fight those who forget. Because if we forget who, are the, who the guilty are, we are accomplices. Now, pause one second. The word forget, in Italian, the word is scordare. And to remember is ricordare. And a colleague of mine is a, etymologist and also a, a, a linguist. And she explained to me the roots of the word. Scordare means to remove from one's heart. Ricordare means to retrieve into one's heart, to recollect into one's heart. So when you say you forget, it's saying whatever this is, I removed the issue from my heart. And a little story about this. I was giving a lecture in New York about, about this work years ago, you know, maybe 15 years ago. And this elderly gentleman came up to me, maybe in his 80s, a very little man, but he had the kindest and saddest eyes. And he said, uh, Dr. Conforti, can I call you Michael? I said, of course, of course. He said, I really, I really like your work. I respect it very much. But can I make one criticism? I said, yes, because I knew he wasn't out with you just to spar. This man was so filled with soul and, and, and passion. He said, during your lecture, you mentioned at one point that we may never understand, or we probably would never understand what created the Holocaust. He said, can I ask you to not to, to revisit that? And he said the same thing we all said. He said, because when we stop trying to understand it, we open the door for its reoccurrence. And I said, oh my God, I am, and, and I meant it from the bottom of my heart. I said, I am so sorry. And I shook his hand. As he shook his, shook his hand, you see the numbers on his arm. I'll never forget that. And all the greats, you know, talk about, I mean, all, all the, the, the sages and dreamers from antiquity talk about memory. So. And now the boy is turning to me. Tell me, what have you done? Like, okay, that, and I tell him I've tried that. I have tried to keep memory alive that I've tried to fight those who would forget, forget, remember, scordati, to remove from your heart. Because if we forget who the guilty are, we are the accomplices. You realize how powerful that is for all of us as we look at the situation right now with what's going on in the world? And then I explained to him how naive we were, that the world did not know and remained silent. And that is why I swore never to be silent when, when and whenever or wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. 
Isn't that an incredible line? Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Whenever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that must at that moment become the center of the universe. And this is the next piece that I, I, I struggle with. He says, yes, I have faith. Faith in God and even his creation. Without it, no action would be possible. And action is the only remedy to indifference, the most insidious danger of all. Isn't this the meaning of Alfred Nobel's legacy? Wasn't his fear of war a shield against war? There is much to be done, and there is much that can be done. One person of dignity can make a difference, a difference between life and death. As long as one dissident is in prison, our freedom will not be true. As long as one child is hungry, our lives will be filled with anguish and shame. What all these victims need above all is to know that they are not alone and that we are not forgetting them. We are not removing them from our hearts. Okay. And when their voices are still, we shall lend them ours. And while their freedom depends on ours, the quality of our freedom depends on theirs. And this thing, they're not alone. I mean, in the interview I just heard, when the United Nations made this, whatever you want to call it, this declaration being against the uh, attempt to annex these parts of Ukraine, they said, we want the Ukrainian people to know they're not alone. It, it's great in one hand, but there's another level. There's a type of collective impotence that, that's driving a lot of this, whether fear, look, believe me, I'm not, I'm not naive. I think we've all been afraid of, of one big thing, uh, nuclear warfare. And again, I, I would love to hear my uh, colleagues speak about this at some point. I'll leave plenty of room for this. I'm sure we're afraid that if we go in, they're going to they're going to do nuclear wars. And this may be a piece to to jump for a minute to something here, which is really important about warfare. The scientists from the Manhattan Project, responsible for the creation of the atomic bomb, crafted and signed what is known as a Sleazlid uh, petition. And this was sent to the president of the United States. He was, I believe, a Polish scientist. He was one of the 70 scientists involved in the Manhattan Project. You know about that, Clay? Would you do work on something like you do work with uh, something similar? So all the scientists, they, they made the atomic bomb, right? And they signed this petition. Here's this one it says. It's unbelievable. And they send this petition to the president, President uh, Truman. And they write, the development of atomic power will provide nations with new means of destruction. The atomic bombs at our disposal represent only the first step in this direction. And there's almost no limit to the destructive power which will become available in the course of their future development. Thus a, nature, excuse me, thus a nation which sets the precedent of using this newly liberated forces of nature for purposes of destruction may have to bear the responsibility of opening the door to an era of devastation on unimaginable scale. These are the people that made the bomb, okay? The creators of the atomic bomb. In view of the foregoing, we the undersigned members of this committee respectfully petition first that you exercise your power as commander in chief to rule that the United States shall not resort to the use of atomic bombs in this war, unless the terms which will be imposed upon Japan have been made public in detail and Japan knowing these terms has refused to surrender. For some reason, the president, they say, never saw it, never read it or never saw it, okay? But there was never a response. With the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there were approximately 170,000 lives lost in a moment. Just this morning, an Italian-Japanese friend of mine whose mother was born in Japan told me that she was in favor of dropping the bomb because she knew that the Japanese would not surrender, most likely. She was afraid they wouldn't surrender. So she said, let's do it, do it, do it, do it. 
The next piece that's incredible is this. Evidence of this intoxication and humanity's possession by this God complex of making war, being able to destroy and create life and destroy life is found in an unlikely place in the writings of Robert Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. Now this, I mean, this is incredible stuff that I discovered in doing this research. In witnessing the testing of the atomic bomb in the New Mexico desert, he writes, if the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the right one, like the bomb. Now this next piece is even more powerful. In a brilliant article written by a man named James Templeton, we learn that after the creation and detonation of the atomic bomb, Oppenheimer quoted from the sacred text, the Bhagavad Gita, realizing and having created this bomb, claims that this Oppenheimer now, right? He says, now I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. Not on him. Templeton reminds us that the great Hindu God is not only involved in the creation, but also the disillusion of the world and suggests that the quotation, now I have become death, the destroyer of the world, is literally the world destroying time and that everything is in the hands of the divine. Is the next piece. We also learn that two years after the Trinity explosion, Oppenheimer was, Oppenheimer was heard to say that physicists have known sin. And this is the knowledge that they cannot lose. I'll read that line again. And this goes into what I said earlier about unconscious guilt. You wonder how it's going to play out. We also learn that two years after the Trinity explosion, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer was heard to say that, quote, the physicists have known sin. And this is knowledge that they cannot lose. Frankenstein is the story of humans creating life. We have destroying life, right, on one hand. Frankenstein is the story of humans creating life. We play God as we do in the creation of nuclear energy and the creation of the atomic and nuclear bomb. And he hold in the decision whether an individual will live or die in our hands. This messianic hunger to be God, to transcend all the limitations of the human condition, causes us to enter a domain beyond the aspirations of Phaeton, of Icarus, and Daedalus. And instead, we enter a psychotic, godlike world Psychopathic idealization and identification with the God complex. Massive messianic inflation. <clears throat> it is important to remember that the original term for the psychopath, you know what that is, Will? You know this? The original term? Moral insanity. When they first did the nosiology of the different disorders, I think what Crickland did, right? He did the whole thing. It was moral insanity, the original term. It's all been cleaned up. More saying, a more fitting description for the life and activities of such individuals. Here we do well to seriously consider the following words found in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, who writes, Be aware, for I am fearless and therefore powerful. If I cannot inspire love, I will cause fear. And if I have nothing to lose, you better fear me. This is why, uh, I'll say something here, this is why I've been really afraid of this war going on right now. Because I don't, I don't know what Putin has to lose. You don't know. And I think that could drive him over the edge. In 1931, two of the greatest minds in history began a collaboration which lasted for more than two years and produced a little known yet profoundly important work called the book I mentioned, Why War? Here, Einstein and Freud began their correspondence looking at what it was that was creating this uh, unrest in the human condition and, and creating the uh, capacity for evil and destruction. Einstein writes, here's a letter from Einstein to Freud, okay? Great, dear Dr. Freud, is there any way of delivering mankind from the menace of war? It is common knowledge that with the, ad, with the advance of modern science, this issue has come to mean a matter of life and death to civilization as we know it. Nevertheless, for all the zeal displayed, every attempt at a solution has ended in a lamentable breakdown. I greatly admire your passion to ascertain the, tr ascertain the truth, a passion that has come to dominate all else in your thinking. 
you have shown with the irresistible lucidity how inseparably the aggressive and destructive instincts are bound up in the human psyche with those of love and the lust for life. At the same time, your convincing arguments make manifest your deep devotion to the great goal of the internal and external liberation of humanity from the evils of war. They, they, they were not naive. This is not just being uh, a dove or looking for peace. Or, they say, well, can we do this? What are we doing to humanity? Is there any way that with all your studies of the psyche, first of all your studies of quantum physics, is there anything we could do to, that we can learn, that we have learned? Let me, let me read Freud's response. Freud writes, all my life, he writes to Einstein, I've had to tell people truths that were very difficult. Now that I am old, I certainly do not want to fool them. And I don't feel. In evolution, a path was traced that led away from violence to law. But for the transition from crude violence to the reign of law, a certain psychological condition was first obtained. He continues in writing that there is but one sure way of ending war, and that is, unfortunately, he's saying, there's one sure way of ending war, and that is the establishment by common consent of a central control, external, which shall have the last word in every conflict of interest. However, he concludes that as things are, this is a forlorn hope. He writes, our hope is that this instinct, this ethological impulse and need will be transformed into something so different and humane so that the axiom right as might is replaced by a deepening of our capacity for reflection, insight, diplomacy, and eros. Is this an idealistic flight of fancy? Well, this is my writing. This is me here. Is this an idealistic flight of fancy? Perhaps, but I will say that the notion of individual peace Peace within families and nation has never been the pablum I've been fed on. That slice of the imagined good life never quite made it to the table where I grew up in my family and what I saw. Yet we all still hope. And it's to this hope that this presentation is dedicated. From the beginning of time, it's been the artists and the writers and the poets and the dancers that have been able to express the, the unexpressible. And one piece you may be familiar with is the work of Henry uh, Gorecki. He wrote a piece probably in the 70s called The Symphony of Sorrowful Songs, also called the, the Third Symphony and the Symphony of Sorrowful Songs. And it was, it was uh, the motivation for this was he read a poem, or he read a story that Somebody went to Auschwitz and he found on the wall a mother's lamentation to her son. Let me read it. And he said, I, I he said, as, as human being, I have to do something with this. I can't just live with this. And he created one of the most powerful pieces of music humanity has known. Again, Symphony of Sorrowful Songs and the Third Symphony. And it's Gorecki, G-O-R-E-C-K-I. This is the third movement. Where has he gone, my dearest son? Perhaps during the uprising, the cruel enemy killed him. Ah, you bad people. In the name of God, the most hell holy, tell me why did you kill my son? Never again will I have his support. Even if I cry my old eyes out, were my bitter tears to create another river, they would not restore to life my son. He lies in his grave, and I know not where, though I keep asking people everywhere. Perhaps the poor child lies in a rough ditch, and instead he could have been lying in his warm bed. Sing for him. And Gorecki created this incredible, incredible piece of music. We have no right to project our own evil onto others or to allow others to go through such torture. It was Eric Neumann in one of the most brilliant books ever written. I think he should get the Nobel Prize for it. I mean, he's now deceased, of course, but uh, depth psychology and a new ethic. And he makes one of the most profound things I've ever heard in my life. He said, look, one of the things that drives war is projections. It's you. You're the evil ones. What you did to my people. No, what you did. And one of the great examples of this is right after 9-11. I'm from New York, right? 
right after 9-11, Bush, the president, the young one, I never know what the, the initials are, the young, the young Bush when he's president, he said, we're going to whoop them for what they did. We're going to whoop them. We're going to get them and going to whoop them. And everyone said, we're going to get them. Those horrible people, what they did. Now, of course, they did horrible things. Horrible. Where I'm from, it, it, what more than uh, how many how many kids were made orphans in, in, one, in one day? They lost both parents in one day. It was from New York, Long Island, New Jersey, or in my area. So we we got we we're going to kill them. And look, I, I'm not denying that. I, I have believe me. I was just saying it's the same tradition we still believe in the vendetta. It's real. Okay, vendicarsi to to retaliate. I felt the same hatred as all of as most of us probably felt, the same horror, the sadness, the tragedy. But we all begin with, we're going to get them, we're going to get them. One voice came out of the wilderness, one voice in the wilderness came out to offer a piece of sanity. Colin Powell, Colin Powell. Who was he, Secretary of State? Do you remember, Clay, what his position was, Colin Powell, Secretary of State? He said, this, of course it's horrible, we have to retaliate. We have to have military uh, retaliation. He said, but why don't we ask the question, why do they hate us so much? What did we do to make them hate us so much? When I heard that, he said, oh, my God, thank you. And that, that's not meant to obliterate the, 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 the need to retaliate, okay? And we did what we had. To, I mean, look, these people brought America to, to its knees, economically, always, right? What Neumann says is when we are involved in war, we are involved in the working of projections. We project our evil onto the other. It's Bin Laden. It's now the Ukrainians, or now it's the Russians, or the, the Germans, or whatever. Look, look, look at what Hitler did. Hitler was 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 possessed by what archetype? It's the archetype of contamination. That was, well, maybe the one, but it was the major archetype. He was the, he wanted to eliminate contamination. He said, you know what? The the, the Jews over there, they're, they're they're inferior, and I want to get rid of them. Could you imagine, let's do like a crazy fantasy for a minute. Imagine having him in an analyst couch or something in the office. Say, do you realize what you're dealing with? You're projecting your own contamination, your own self, self-loathing onto all these people. Take it home and look in the mirror. No, of course, it's a fantasy. You can't do it. But Neumann's piece is the paranoia that follows the projection of they did it is that what you threw out there, they're the bad ones. The paranoia is we're, we're afraid, right? Remember what happened after 9-11? Code orange and code blue and not safe today. All the codes, danger danger of retaliation, danger for terrorist attack. We lived in, in a paranoid state in America for quite a while. Neumann made the most brilliant observation I ever heard in my life about this. He said the paranoia is the archetypal realization that what we projected externally is going to come back to get us. It's a boomerang, basically. Is that clear what he's saying? He said, the evil, you terrible people, what you did to my country. He said, yes. That evil that we see in them, which is it's, it's true. It's not Projection doesn't mean it's not true. But when you only, only keep it out there, Colin Powell tried to heal that split when he said, what, what do we do to make him hate us? And again, he wasn't trying to ameliorate or to reduce or to eliminate the need for retaliatory action. But he said, don't we need to be responsible? Did we do something? That's Neumann's whole piece. It's brilliant that, again, when we're in a, oh, my God, they're going to get us. Who's coming in the door? What's coming in the door? The ghost, it's your own, our own shadow that we've projected externally. As we have no right to project our evil onto others or to allow, we, me, we have no right to project our own evil onto others or to allow others to go through such torture. It is our ethical and moral mandate to shoulder our own destructive impulses and to find a way to not only understand, but to find a way to live and work with psyche, to stop the madness of demonic messianic possessions. Perhaps the work may also involve direct encounter. This is what he said at the very beginning. Perhaps this work may also involve direct encounter, not only with the individual's relationship to the archetypal, but with the archetype itself. Again, perhaps a, a flight into fantasy, science fiction, or illusion. But let's reach for the stars and settle for a handful of dust. Isn't there some biblical reference to what can be made with a lump of clay? 
However, I do understand that when we speak of psychopathy, moral insanity, there is the absence of morality, no sense of ethics, and humanity is lost at such times. So where does this leave us in this work? It may well be that Freud and Jung are correct in suggesting that humanity is not now or may never be able to carry their own evil. Pause right there. Since the beginning of time, humanity has sought to expiate guilt. From the scapegoat to the sin eater to confession. They're all attempts to expiate our own guilt because we can't live with it. And they said in the opening of this talk, as an analyst for 40 years, I could tell you one of the things that is, is so diff, so debilitating for people is trying to live with the unconscious guilt. It takes them down because they can't deal with it. Okay, we never be able to carry their own evil. This creates a perilous situation, suggesting that at this time, evil and destruction must be stopped on a collective level, unfortunately while understanding that the deeper need, our work in, as yogin-oriented people, right? That the deeper need is to find some way to integrate and live with such annihilating contents that exist within the soul of humanity, of the individual and humanity. Look, if, if Hitler, if all these world leaders, they do this stuff, it's got to be alive in, in the world and in the psyche. That's what Jung taught us. He said, this is the eruption of the dark unconscious. And what's erupting is things that live in the unconscious. And while only while we are afraid of it, whatever, I'm saying part of the work right now for us, I believe. And I don't I don't hope to get us down inflated. I don't think so. But even if it's a little idealistic, and I'm not idealistic, okay? I got I say I grew up in the streets, I'm not idealistic. To hope that maybe we could find some way to reduce the effect, like turn it down like a dial a little bit. The power, when this thing starts to erupt, you could see it. When the volcano starts, you pretty much know when it's going to be a giant eruption, explosion. However, so too is our deep, childlike hope to find a hero capable of caring for the collective good. And that with this undifferentiated enthusiasm, we cast such projections as heroes on those truly incapable to carry out such a task. The genuine hero, writes Elie Wiesel is the one who cares more for the community than for their own well-being. They give the food to the other. They give the housing to somebody else. They give their blankets and their clothing and take care of somebody else. This needs to be our yardstick and perhaps even our procrustean bed to weigh this on. In terms of specific suggestions, I recommend the following. That presidents no longer receive preferential treatment when it comes to legal, ethical, or moral concerns. It's interesting what's going on today with some of the things coming out of the, of the courts around, um, what do you call it, the, the papers, and what do you call the papers in the uh, uh, past. That president's children be allowed or encouraged to join the military. And I look, I understand the reason, a lot of the reasons why, I got it, because they're going to hold them hostage. But you, you see what I'm getting at with this, how subtle it is? If your kid is in the war, you're going to be thinking twice and three times. And what's his name? Michael Michael Moore, when he made that movie a while ago, a bunch of years ago, he went to uh, interview some of the, uh, the senators. And he went there and he said, Senator, is your kid going to war? I said, what are you kidding me? My kid's never going to war. What about you? He said, you out of your mind? You think I'm nuts? I'm not sending my kid to war. My kid's never going to war. I'll take care of it. And he just smiled into the camera. You put your kid in there. And, you know, in some ways, and again, this may not be so politically correct to say, I think in part our hope for a woman, and I, I hope for a woman president too, I really do. I, I want somebody, I want a good person in the office, man or woman, I want somebody good. I think our archetypal hunger for a woman is for Eros. Would a woman be as prone to send these kids to war knowing they could come back in these body bags? The thing you, the child you gave birth to, the child you held in your arms and you nursed by your side. I think it may be different. And uh, yeah, see, I'm always trying to understand. That's my work when, when you gave a lovely introduction to my, what I do. I'm always trying to look at the archetypal pattern that's driving the experience of what we do. Okay, so the president's children be allowed or encouraged <coughs> to join the military. Next, in the last number three, that any prospective leader, president, with a series of allegations of deceit, fraud, sexual violations, et cetera, 
undergo Senate and judicial hearings and until proven innocent, a little different, right? Until proven innocent will not be allowed to assume the presidency. Another one is to revoke the practice of allowing presidential pardons. It all leads to the un, un, uncontrolled proliferation of inflation. Okay. The last one, number five. I found, again, one of these little known letters that Einstein wrote to Freud even before the, 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 the book, when he said, let's create a committee of Nobel Prize laureates and famous people around the world to, uh, to, to, to comment on, on world situation. People that have no monetary value in this thing, no monetary investment, nothing. Everyone just, everyone uh, said, I'm not doing it. Ilya Wiesel tried the same thing of all Nobel Prize candidates, uh, Nobel Prize recipients. They all refused. They said, we don't want to be part of this. So I would say if we can create some kind of commission like what they tried with UNESCO and the United Nations to have world leaders that have no monetary and political investment in the thing, but they care about humanity and bring some analysts and people that know about these archetypal dynamics. And now conclusion. From the beginning of time, our poets and artists, musicians, philosophers, and writers have spoken about the need to find a relationship to Eros and Hadeotic. Hadeotic uh, is about Hades, okay? The instinct for destruction. Herein lies the promise of a better life. Until then, we have to hope and find ways for engaging the recollection of projections onto others. Recollection is the term von Franz uses, for pulling them back, pulling back the projection. Perhaps this is where a personal and collective eros begins to take shape and to root. One of the great references to eros is found in Elie Wiesel's book, Gates of the Forest. And in the latter part of the book, the main character, Claire, her husband, his name is Lieb. Now hold that name, if you know German or, or hold that name. Lieb actually died in, in one, he was one of the, uh, the militia going up a little a band of Jewish people living in the forest. There were militants going against the uh, the Germans. And one of the raids that they did, uh, Lieb got killed. So his wife, Claire, is back at the in the woods, in the, in the, the hut and everything, right? And a man falls in love with her. Says, I, I, Claire, it's me, Gregoria. I've always loved you. Now that Lieb is dead, you could be with me. And she says, Lieb, Lieb isn't dead. Lieb's coming home. No, 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 Lee will be, be back here any day. He's dead. He died in one of the raids. He's dead. The, the, the comrade said he's gone. <laughs> You're mistaken. I wrote a chapter in a book about this a while ago, and, and I and my first draft, I missed the whole point. I said, see, see, Lee, she's in denial. She's in denial. He wants to offer a life and to love or whatever. And until I realized, wait a minute, you know what leave means, the word? Love. What she's saying is love hasn't died. Eros hasn't died. And it's up to us to make sense of what this means that Lieb hasn't died. Thank you for your time and patience and to listening to these very, I think, difficult ideas and, and perspectives. And I really thank all of you for the invitation and you know, all of you online. I can't see you tonight, all you 40 people, for your you know, patience on, on, a, what's the night, on a Thursday night to be part of this. Any questions, you know, maybe we take questions right now. So, and thank you, Will and, and Dana, for your invite. Thank you, Michael, uh, for the very intense, heavy, and, and valuable conversation. Uh, I've been thinking about what you're saying about the, the field, the archetypal field that comes with war and, and the way that you're describing it. And I'm personally making a tremendous amount of value out of it. I'm eager to hear what our panelists' thoughts are. Um, all of them. Uh, one thought that's, that's on my mind is a uh, little Achilles heel to the structure that you've described of this archetype of war, where you talk about, you know, a president may need to put their son or daughter up for the draft or into the military. That also is based on this evaporating illusion that wars are only fought abroad. And as we're seeing now, there is no containing war to something abroad anymore because we see the economic, we see so many different implications that come back to our experience uh, to the point of, of threats of, of everything from a biological to nuclear war. So the idea that war can be contained abroad, I, I wonder if that will change. 
our yeah. whole conceptual relationship. I wonder what you think. Well, it's a great comment. Again, my motivation for this is trying to bring Eros into it. And I, I'm not I'm not the love doctor. Remember Leo Basali eight years ago, the hug, the hug doctor, love doctor? That's not my thing. I just I can't take it no more. I mean, I've been writing and studying about the Holocaust for the past 20 years. I've been seeped in dealing with terrible traumas throughout my 40-year career as an analyst. I saw terrible violence growing up. As I say, I work with mafia members. And you say, there's got to be some stop to this stuff. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm grabbing at straws. I'm clutching whatever the expression. I'm grabbing at straws like a lot of us. Your point is right. It's, it's no longer just uh, localized, the war. It hits us on every level. But I, I think the more a leader is shielded from this, I think the more we're going to have trouble. The more, the, the, if you... If it, if I had the time to talk about why, what these little categories are, you know, about justice and all that. I think one of the things that creates an incredible sense of violence in this country is the inequity. You and I would be in jail for this stuff that has been pulled by politicians from both sides, from Biden and Trump. We'd, we'd be in jail so quick and we'd never get the hell out of there. When, when, and when you're saying a minority. And you get stopped for a, tra a traffic ticket, or you got whatever, and they put you in jail for a couple of days, you don't have the money to pay the ticket, give me a break. And, and then you get this going on. You think that doesn't create hatred and, and, and retaliatory actions and dissent? That's part of my paper. I mean, if everyone, I, I'm happy to do that for you guys. The paper on the archetypal approach to school shootings. It's, it's a lot about how do you live with this? It's such a sense of malaise and, and helplessness when our government so it's a great comment, Will. You know, the war and the effects and the contagious mm, results of all this, it's not, it's not localized anymore. It's a great comment. Then I, I welcome the comments from, uh, from a veterans and, and Christoph from Science and Jonas, incredible experiences you must have had in your life and Will. So anything, and we have a participant, you, your participants that are still on, they want to ask anything. So I'll, I'll, I'll let you do them. No, you do the moderate. Okay. Well, sure thing. Yeah. You know, uh, any of you that have a thought that, that you want to lead into, you know, I've got a number of questions, but. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me jump in here for a second. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that occurs to me is that we're always looking from where we are and going forward and we're not really looking back to try to learn from what it was that we could have done. There's a fellow who's doing panoramic exhibits in Europe right now and named Yadigar Assisi. And he has this panorama in Leipzig called 9-11. Mm -hmm. Well, instead of being an exhibit about the the terror that went on of 9-11, the exhibit is five minutes before the event happened. Wow. And you walk into this panorama and the point of the exhibit is to reflect upon what would you do because we're always five minutes away from the next thing happening. Wow. Brilliant. And, and it is the most compelling exhibit. It's completely immersive. Um, it's set in an old um, tanker of some sort. It's round, you go up on a scaffolding. He's got 25 of these exhibits around Europe and they're immersive. You come out of there transformed outside of the exhibit in the hall beyond where the projection of the panorama is there are ex there are exhibits that talk about the terror of it happening but inside the exhibit itself it takes you in there and asks you to ask the difficult questions what what would we do if we only had five minutes before the next thing happened how would we how would we live ourselves? That's brilliant. I add something there. I, uh, I, I play uh, shakuhachi, Japanese bamboo flute. Uh, my teacher's in Kyoto, and he lost relatives, close relatives, in the in the bombings. And he uh, he taught me a piece called Kojun no Tsuki, which it, in English means "moon over the ruined castle." And this moon is moon over over what the ruined. 
moon over the ruined castle. Wow. And um, I play this each year in August uh, at a local park where uh, many of us collect to remember and pray for the victims. And something I discovered in my research for playing Kojo no Tsuki uh, this last uh, August is that when the Enola Gay uh, let loose the bomb, it took 45 seconds for it to explode. And during that 45 seconds, I'm just, you know, echoing what you just said, Dana. During that 45 seconds, it was a normal sunny day uh, in Hiroshima. And people were going to school or work or shopping. It was just a normal fucking day. And uh, in a way, you know, that's a real wake up call to me that um, we're always on the edge of extinction. Every moment, I mean, we could all have a heart attack right now. You know, we don't know. But what what that does for me is to awaken this incredible yeah. compassion and love and and the preciousness of life of each moment is so precious. Yeah. And so that it leads me to to touch people heart to heart. Yeah. That we we could all be gone in an instant. Um, so. I, I just last thing I'll share just because I've been thinking about it a lot. I, I started doing a biography based on war, knowing this this was coming up. And um, I, I grew up in an uh, alcoholic family in northern Wisconsin. Uh, I think I've talked about this before at the Miss Salon. So I witnessed uh, domestic violence and uh, drunken parents coming. They owned a bar. So from the time I was eight to 18 uh, and northern Wisconsin, country music on the jukebox, people getting drunker and drunker and then start hitting each other and uh, terrified. And I would protect my younger brother and sister, whatever way I could. But my uh, grandmother, the archetype that came to me was a Lutheran Christian, German Lutheran Christian, which is how you go back into history. And I, when I'm meditating and praying, um, I see my, my grandfather who was German, fighting in World War I in a, in a trench. And he, his buddy, his lifelong buddy, well, they're only 20 or so, uh, was shot in the forehead by the Germans. Well, my grandfather was German and he was experiencing, um, uh, you know, anti-German attitudes from all the people in Wisconsin. And he went to fight the Germans wow. and he translated for the American soldiers. He put himself right in the middle of all that. And I, you know, he, he just lives in my heart as someone who stepped forward with his life. And um, he maybe he had 45 seconds and he, he was one of the lucky ones. So thank hey, you. Hey, well, thank, thank you for you, your Michael. comments. Can I add one piece to that? When you talk about the bombings and in all the gay, yeah. one of our students in the program, her name happened to be Luann Conforti, we're not related, but she did a study of the, um, the unconscious effects on the pilots. Yes. You know, she found, you know, who had the most powerful effects? The one that determined, the one that finally said, it's not the navigator, the, the weather special, whatever you call that term, I, maybe you, you veterans could help me with that. Whichever one says today, because of the wind, the wind speed, whatever, uh, we can't do it, we can't do it. Now, today, 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 they said when they studied his life afterwards, he was the one that was most decimated by what happened, more than the pilots. And in terms of your, your your grandfather, it's one of our faculty, you know, Christoph, um, Jacqueline, Jacqueline at the uh, your Jung Institute over in, in Zurich, in the Ron Franz group, her grandfather did, did what you're talking about. He saved, he came in and helped many of the Jews to, into freedom, risked his life for it. You know, you, you, you know, what you say is very powerful, Jones, because I feel the same that my heart breaks. I, I, I almost can't take too much more of it when you just watch it. When I saw when I saw my student in the in the, the bunker, crying her eyes, I said, well, "I don't know what I'm going to die or not today." But it's the closest I ever came. You guys live it. I'm uh, Nathan and Clay. You you live that. It's the closest I've ever come to it. Thank you for your comments. I'd love to hear your music someday. Is your shakuhachi flute nearby? Wow! <laughs> what a great opportunity. Are these all handmade? These are, uh, some are made um, 
by Americans who studied in Japan, and some are from Japanese teachers, um, and they're made, you know, just from from bamboo, four okay. holes in the top and one in the back, and you blow across the top. Um, So that's just a phrase from Kojo. Isn't that beautiful? It really captures the the sounds of the country. Yeah, and you know, there's a when I play it, there's that s sense of a, aggression that I used to think I just have to disown aggression. But something mm -hmm. I learned from the Dalai Lama and my Tibetan teachers is the Vajra sword. Mm -hmm. This is a sword that cuts mm -hmm. through bullshit without creating any unintended consequences. <laughs> that's great. I, I never heard that. <laughs> Jonas, isn't it the this is is this the flute that was carried by uh, former samurai no longer carrying their swords? Yes, and that's yeah. the reason. Uh, yeah, for centuries, uh, lay people could not play the shakuhachi because the the, the uh, shakuhachi players would wander around collecting alms from the villagers. But at a certain point in the eighteen early eighteenth century, they started to leave. The root end on it wasn't on here um, before that, and that's to make it heavier so they could defend themselves. Wow, God! <laughs> it's yeah, I, it's so interesting to think about this this duality of uh, art and war, love and war, connecting of course art and and love, and um, you know it's just a great image of of a sword becoming displaced by a musical instrument, and then then artists and musicians still defending themselves and defending peace as they have to, even with their art. It's like, you know, um, incredibly beautiful. And I know a number of artists are with us tonight, some from, from my school. Well, what about our veterans? Any comments? A couple of observations. Um, as you were talking, I went back to uh, the fall of 2018 and I was invited to the Parliament of the World's Religions and it was in Toronto. There were 10,000 people there. Okay. It was a week long. There were over 500 sessions. And I, I noticed that there was not one session on men. Now, I happen to believe that we might be the elephant in the room here. We were just talking about love and war, typically represented as Mars and Aphrodite. You know, there, there is something uh, we, we always have to question if there's something masculine about the way we engage war or something lacking in feminine. So what I said was Parliament of the World's Religions, the fall of 2018, 10,000 people, 80 plus religious traditions, over 500 sessions, and there was not one session on men. Yeah. Now, I happen to think that we might be in the whole patriarchal system here that we might be the elephant in the room mm -hmm. and what a golden opportunity to address this at some level right. and um, one of the things that i've that i'm drawn towards is raising compassion consciousness in men and uh, that's what my podcast is in search of the new compassionate male and uh, dr james doty stanford uh, he heads up the, he founded and heads up the uh, Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And their studies show that compassion is innate. Mm -hmm. We're born with it. And it's part of our DNA. <laughs> and when you said, gee, war gets into the DNA, you know, generations down, um, that really, really rang home. But the point that he also makes is that it's got to be nurtured. Yeah. And um, as long as we're approaching things from a fear base, nurturing compassion is yeah. a bit more of a challenge. And I'm just curious, I mean, I kind of bounced around there, but if you had any observations on that. I, I, again, I love it. I mean, I was 
just visiting my, my son and his family the other day, the little boy, a year and a half. And it's so interesting. At that age, you think the kids who eat, they eat the meal and they, whatever. He shares it with you. And I thought, my God. I mean, this is right out of Melanie Klein of envy and gratitude. You you would think he's no, no, this is my macaroni, this is my my meatball or whatever. He, he, he does this all the time. And I realize it's he must feel so secure that there's abundance, there's enough for him that he could he said, Look, I'm loved, I'm cared about. You have some. You want my you want my this, you want this? A year and a half. And I was so taken. It's I think it's the compassion you're talking about. Yeah. And all, all the stuff I tried to get at in here was trying to find some way to counteract. I mean, to acknowledge the evil destruction. But how do you, do you cultivate that when it's been so repressed? I, think I, I love it. I love what you're saying with that. Well, and and I think talking about the mm-hmm. conscious and the unconscious, you know, I think what I kind of see here is that, you know, fear kills. Yeah. Uh, unconscious fear kills. And it kills the archetype. You know, I don't kill you, the person. I kill what you represent. Yeah. Unconscious compassion is what we're born with. And the point was made earlier about the true hero is the compassionate hero. Yeah. Now, you know, the Bible talks about John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. When one soldier or one Marine throws himself in harm's way um, to save a friend. That's not a, that's not an intellectual decision. Yeah. That's Gotta right be, here. Yeah. That's, you know, if I'm sitting next to somebody and their chairs, they start to fall back in their chair. I don't sit there and go, well, what am I going to do? I, I do this. That's innate. That's where we are. And it's raising that consciousness that, that that is part of who we are. The, the piece I would add to the, I'm sorry, the piece I would add to that, Clay, is that again, from from a lot of analytic experience, it's got to be balanced by the wherever the the evil and destruction is in the psyche. I mean, to go with compassion. I mean, look, I'm with you. Whatever it takes, I, I'm with you. I'll put all of the investments in, in in that. However, we are also born with the shadow, and I think you know when we get when we see how religion has handled this, I, I think we've had a an interesting thing about you know, in Christianity, we've got God and the devil, right? And they're brothers. And, you know, many people the, in, in psychoanalytic uh, circles, you say, well, they're splitting. They can't live with God and the devil together. They have to split them. And you know what I, I say? I think you have the God of the, whatever, whatever the gods really are. We don't never know. But there is a domain of benevolence. And it's a whole field, okay? Well, the uh, an archetypal field. There is a field of benevolence. My little grandson sharing his food. There is a field of diabolical behavior. Both are real. And I think to get to the compassion that you were talking about, I think it, the other piece has got to be acknowledged somehow. Absolutely. Otherwise, I, think I totally agree. Yeah. 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 You can't be idealistic and live over no. here. No. Either extreme is... Exactly. Yeah. Is an addiction, so to speak. And in many ways, this is an homage to look at unconscious dynamics. And, and I, I was, think it's so needed. I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, no, no, sorry. Thank you. I, I was thinking of you, Clay, just the uh, last week um, in something that might be kind of a, a middle ground or a meeting place for what we're talking about. My, my favorite baseball team won the World Series last year. And they just uh, they just show I'm going to show you this clip. I sent it out to all my friends when I saw them. I have, hold on, let me get my volume back. Hold on. I sent it to all my friends and I was like, you know, this is not the baseball team I grew up with. That's not the dugout. That's you know, just 40 men just loving each other and telling everybody they love each other. But even something else, though, yeah. they won because of it. They're the yeah. best team in the world because of it. And we tend to think, we tell ourselves a myth that if you want to win, you got to be the angry warlike one. We live in a myth that we need to compete yeah. individually to win. But what about a world where we start to recognize the myth that we win through love? Yeah. Actually win. It'd be wonderful. I. Um, that's why the podcast is titled In Search of the New Compassionate Male. Oh, wow. Wow. Hmm. And I say new because I think it can be 
it can be renewed. It's there. If we call it out, if we point to it and say, that is compassion. Yeah. It's innate. We each have it, point to it, define it. This, this burn that wants to come out, but that the patriarchy has us pushed down, that burn is goodness. And it gets all balled up. If we can let it, let that, let that emotion, the healthy emotion out, then I think we have hope. We're born into a world of belonging that we innately trust. And that sense of collective is where we start with our family, with one another, with our siblings, with our community. We're taught individuality. Individuality isn't something that comes up at birth. It's something that is instilled in us through education, through school, and all of the things. And gradually we grow apart. You know, we become uh, warriors. We defend territory, you know. So what you're saying about the, the archetype, the archetype is a connective fiber in all of us that gives us that thing that we call ourselves in common and it unites us in a in a in a field we meet one another in a field and we recognize that when we talk with one another we're seeing a part of ourselves in an, in other people it's that innate sense of belonging because you don't hurt what you belong to yeah i, I my research in life has been about the Christian uh, mystical tradition. And uh, I just just wrote a book called uh, My Dear Far Nearness. And the name, it's a name for God um, coined by Marguerite Porat in the 14th century, My Dear Far Nearness, that God is not, it's not a realistic understanding of God. God is near and far and everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, no place in every place. Well, I uh, uh, have been uh, starting to do podcasts about the book too and trying to get Christians to understand this belonging that you're talking about is traditionally in the Hebrew and Christian traditions, what the role of the spirit, I call it the Ruach or Hagias Pneuma in Greek is, is the, the betweening power of love. That's the role of spirit. And that's, that's what Martin Luther King talked about. That's what Cesar Chavez talked about, that there is a power in us that transcends us, that brings us together. I'm on board. Okay. <laughs> but again, I think it, when you see the power, I mean, again, when Jung talked about the whole Nazi uprising, it, 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 this is a domain, this is an archetypal field that is pre-existent, is pre-formed. And that's why I, I made the comment here, if, and again, it may be flight of fancy, as I said, that if there's any way we could find a way into that world somehow, find out what the hell are the content? Is, is there a secret door, a secret handshake to, to get in there and see what it, how it works? I mean, you realize what we could do with that? So it would be wonderful. So that's part of I, I do think those of you that, yeah, we're all Jungian oriented here. I think that needs to be a, a piece that we take on. Thank you so much for all this and great conversations. Really rich. And, you know, if you, you, you write me, please send me your emails, okay? Christoph, I see, I see you have, a, have some thoughts. I'd love to hear what, what's on your well, mind. I, I wanted to thank you, Michael, for uh, uh, this very rich uh, lecture. and. Uh, Thank you very much. There's, there's many ways I wanted to uh, connect to different things you said. Uh, first, when Will and Dana invited me, I was like wondering, what, what am I doing here? Uh, this is such an important topic. Uh, I'm the physicist of the group. I'm not really, uh, we need some more, someone with a better grasp of this kind of reality and then i thought about different things different dreams i had uh <clears throat> for example a dream a long time ago that i was a collaborator uh you know the people in france collaborating with the nazi uh, and so yeah everybody has a dark side in, uh, inside uh, it's very very important i remember when i started to write poetry when i was a teenager i read victor hugo who was saying uh, uh, have dreams of, of war uh, in my distressed soul. Uh, I would be a warrior if I were not a poet. So uh, I, I come from a family of military people. My grandfather was in the military. My wow. father, my uh, older brother, I went to the military too. 
and I volunteered to go to Czechoslovakia in the beginning of the 90s, and I couldn't go. And so it's, uh, it's something that always interested me. But war for me was always a kind of, uh, when it showed in my dreams, it was about doing a military period, which was about being creative, being uh, when a dream of war would come, it would mean, well, you have to sit down and write. This is a war. And, and for me, the, what you said about the impersonal nature of war is very important. I think uh, things, instead of looking at uh, the duality, love and war, I, I think it's interesting to look at uh, uh, the duality, personal and impersonal. Yeah. And in, inside of us, we have something which is deeply impersonal. We think that we know uh, ourselves very well, but we don't. There is an abyss inside of us. And that is never going to go away, ever. And that's why, in a sense, war will be always a necessity. In the same way that love is a necessity. Uh, Jung was considering that love and war were two opposites. He was talking, for example, at the beginning of the Mysterium Conjunctionis. He was writing that the factors which uh, come together, the conjunctio, are conceived as opposites, either confronting one another in enmity or attracting one another in love. So uh, the conjunctio can happen through war as well. Mm. Uh, that's very important. So. The war happens when you are in touch with the impersonal inside of you. It's uh, always manifesting uh, this way. And I think it's very important that we know each other, that we know ourselves, sorry, each other too, but uh, ourselves, uh, and that we turn this war uh, uh, inside. Uh, this is how you can really solve the problem in a way. Uh, but I, I think that it's so abysmal that uh, you cannot you cannot really integrate infinity. Love is something which is so deep and so profound. Uh, you cannot in integrate that as well. It's something that takes you. And in love, you feel that you know the other better than yourself. And in war, you feel that the other is someone that you need to kill, uh, that you need to make impersonal. But it's the two sides of the same coin, I feel. Wonderful comments, profound, really profound. Oh, thank you, Christoph. Um, thank you, Michael. I appreciate um, all your comments. And um, it's definitely made me think quite a bit. Um, I, uh, I approach kind of from a mythological and depth psychological perspective that um, in my experience and my conversations, I was kind of aware of these sorts of things as I was serving um, and going different places. Uh, one of the things is, uh, from my perspective, I've seen that uh, um, almost every archetype in any pantheon you could come up with exists in what I call martial culture. It's there, it's present. Um, you know, um, if, you know, we were in Iraq and we had a small fire and there were a few of us around it, and that's Hestia, that idea of companionship and closeness and oneness. Um, I, I guess I, from my perspective, in a lot of cases, it seems like it's um, all balled up into one uh, and mixture of the various pantheons rolling over each other as, as you kind of experience these different aspects. Mm -hmm. I think it's different sometimes um, if you've gone through the um, threshold experiences necessary to be repair yourself to go into a situation like that too. Um, but uh, some of the things you were talking about is uh, responsibility uh, for the Holocaust it really got to me. I had some experiences. Um, I worked in uh, the 2000s going into Darfur in Sudan uh, as part of the U.S. military to try and assist with that prevention of that particular genocide by introducing the African Union troops. I spent a lot of time in Rwanda and had friends, um, good friends, and I was sat there 
it was actually Rwandan peacekeeping troops that were going into Sudan and the reflections that they had in terms of uh, their president um, at the time made a speech saying the world stood by and let what happened here, I'm paraphrasing of course, let what happened here uh, and, and did nothing. We won't do any, we will not do nothing. We won't stand by for what was happening in Sudan. And that kind of, as you kind of reflected on the Holocaust and the standing by and uh, Weissel's uh, comments, it was uh, useful to me. And um, it just kind of reminded me again, the my participation in what I call martial culture, which is once you enter military service and then basically to the end of essentially life, it will always be with you in one form or another. Um, it just has to do with this aspect of, um, it really comes down to service and, about, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of love involved in it. Um, I, I'll share another, because it's just been kind of the compassionate aspect. Um, I, we were on one side of a compound and this was in Afghanistan and we heard gunfire on another side of the compound. And that was, we found out one of our friends, you know, our guys were over there and we just started running. And it wasn't that we were running to kill someone, but your entire focus is on getting to someone. Yeah. Um, and so there's all of this aspect rolled up. And I think it's the way in which you approach um, service uh, sometimes that, that makes a difference. Um, so just wanted to share those few thoughts. I mean, to be able to find archetypes in, in war, like you said, all they were all present. I mean, what a, what a vision, what an ability in the midst of all that to see the, the transcendent and the numinous and the presence of, of something that's eternal. I think it's fantastic. I, I think that the American military is a little unique and that it has to go overseas. But, you know, we saw it with the uh, Afghanistan evacuation last year, the Marine standing on the wall reaches down and pulls up this child. He wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah. That was not what he was supposed to do. He's supposed to stand on the wall. He's there protecting them, but they have to go through the process, but move through compassion. And um, there's this concept about stoic warriors and soldiers and huff and, um, through my work, I'm trying to give a peek behind the curtain to actually say it's 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 a whole mix of holistic humanity uh, that that goes into that and uh, is is alive. And I think that's something important too, because if people can see that sort of compassion, they can bring out that idea that um, it's not necessarily a two dimensional character. Um, and then it's been very unique in the fact that as you've gone through different aspects. I might have, I invaded, I went with these, it was with the invasion of Iraq in 2003, but then I go back in 2011 and I'm training the people that I invaded, um, you know, or that I fought against and we're friends. Uh, I lived in Germany and I worked with Fallschirmjäger. Well, 50, 60 years ago, we've been shooting at each other. And I think the temporality, um, and that's why I love the Mahabharata so much, uh, uh, the Hindu epic, uh, because it really brings out that um, these are um, these events uh, can fade and shift over time. And so it lends me some hope in that aspect and understanding of that compassion that that is another person um, and you should be aware. And um, I think from my perspective, uh, uh, me and the people I served with were, were very much aware of what was going on. And there was that aspect of trying to be responsible about that. So... Just some thoughts. I think it'd be interesting putting your comments with, with Dana about looking at antiquity. <clears throat> Archetypal dynamic archetypes are looking at precedents, you know, innate precedents to see how did people handle certain situations. You know, say you become friends with somebody that you were shooting at or whatever, they were shooting at you. How did the ancients handle this? And it's not to it's not to glorify the noble savage or anything like that, but to learn especially in times when maybe the archetype was even more, more of a presence in the life, more of a, of a guiding force. How, what did they do? I mean, one great example is, you know, in many of the indigenous cultures, when the people, when the warriors came back, they were not allowed back into the tribe for a while. You know, they had to go into these kind of like uh, decompression camps. With, they say, you're not allowed back to be with your family. 
because you, you're in, to use our perspective of archetypes, you're in war, you're in the archetype of war. And this is why we have so many stories when somebody comes back and they're at a pool party, somebody surprises them from the back. Hey, how you doing? And the, the, with that understanding, you're in war. Give them a couple of months. Like, you know, a couple of months, a couple of weeks, whatever you need to help them slowly adjust, but to understand that you're in that archetype, you're in that field. All of the properties and propensities that go with that field are in you at that moment, for that time. It's survival. But to allow us to learn how did how did humanity deal with this in the earlier times? I think it's a wonderful lesson, as well as how does humanity do? Go back to my people with the Colosseum, what we what they did. How, how did anything ever stop that? I mean, the, the rampant slaughter. So, you know, I think you get your comments, what you were talking about, and put Dana together, you get a hell of a great meal to, to learn a lot, to learn even more about how we handle this stuff. So, yeah, well, there's one question I want to just leave us, leave us thinking about. <clears throat> um, and you've kind of touched a few different directions. We've talked about war. We've talked about school shootings, shootings uh, and violence. And I just, I just wonder, you know, maybe we can think about uh, – if, if there's any comparison in the psychologies of a shooter and a Putin. Anyway, leave us with that. And I want to thank you to Michael and Nathan, Christoph, Jonas, mm -hmm. Clay, uh, yeah. for a really meaningful evening. And I hope that, you know, we'll, we'll all go out there and keep being ourselves in tough times. Thank you everyone for, uh, uh, difficult evening with a difficult topic and Michael for taking us through this. I would like to go out the same way we came in with a, a moment of silence following the singing bowl. So please um, let's go out quietly, instill love and peace, enter a field of oneness. Thank you, everyone. Thank Michael. You. Thank you very much. Will, Jonas, Christoph, Clay, Nate. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye bye.